formally start the webinar. Uh, and the topic today is how to better understand the voice of the uh, customer. So uh, I think it's a topic that's very much uh, current. Um, and uh, certainly we now get an awful lot of feedback from customers on social media, um, often uh, either very happy or very unhappy customers. And uh, certainly I know a lot of organizations would like to keep the happy, the, sorry, the unhappy stuff off social media. And voice of the customer is one way of understanding what is driving those uh, forms of customer dissatisfaction. So we've lined up two uh, great speakers today, We've both spoken before on our uh, webinar program. Delighted to uh, welcome back uh, Dan Moros from Moo. Welcome back, Dan. Hello, thank you for having me. Pleasure to and, be back. Uh, since we are our last uh, uh, webinar, I think Dan's picked up another couple of awards, which he'll be uh, sharing us with us later. And uh, for those not familiar with uh, with Moo, Dan, what what uh, what does Moo do? So um, we're an online stationery provider. So um, our kind of flagship product is is business cards, and our goal is to make it easy and simple for all sizes of businesses to order beautifully crafted business stationery. Excellent, and indeed, I've uh, had our business cards printed through uh, Moo, which was uh, very nice, uh, really nicely. Um, uh, really nicely done. There's quite a nice texture to them, and you can also do quite small, small numbers. Also, uh, welcome back, David Mason from Business Systems. David, I think it's been about five years since the uh, last webinar uh, we did together. Uh, so it's lovely to have you back. Thank you, John T. It's been about five years. You're quite right. I'm looking about ten years older, though, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> that happens to happens to us all. And David, you're going to be talking through some quite um, novel approaches to voice of the customer, being able to uh, use things like speech analytics and listening to calls to harvest some of the richness of, of customer feedback. That's right. Um, my section is probably more devoted to um, understanding how we might harvest from insight from customers who choose not to readily participate to you know, surveys um, so that we can include those into the mix as well. Excellent. Just a reminder, if uh, people want to watch the replay later on today, we'll have that available from about 3 o'clock. Uh, callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded webinars. Uh, if you'd like to uh, log into our chat room, Here's the, uh, here's the details here, uh, callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. Now there is an advantage of being logged into the chat room, and that is that you can download our webinar slides. Once you're logged in, here is a link to get hold of the uh, webinar slides, and you can click on there. There's a lot of detail going through. And also in here, you can tip it, type in your tips and questions. Uh, which we will uh, respond to during the webinar. And uh, there is a bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates for the uh, uh, for the best tip. Uh, this is the uh, champagne that we're going to be sending out later on today. And uh, I, uh, if there's time, we will announce the winning tip at the end of the uh, end of the webinar. So I'd just like to uh, ask you if you can uh, log into the chat room and if in one or two words you can say, what methods do you use to collect voice of the customer data? So what methods are you using to collect voice of the customer data? In the meantime, while you're doing that, I'm going to be putting up a poll. And the poll is, um, what is your survey response rate? So if you are using surveys to survey your customers, what sort of response rate do you get to those uh, surveys? Is it between 0 and 1%, 2 to 9%, 10 to 24 percent, 25 to 49 percent, or is it more than 50 percent of people surveyed uh, send your answers in? Dan, what do you think is going to be the most uh, most common answer here? I am not sure whether it will be 2 to 9 or 10 to 24 would be my guess. I think it depends on the survey that uh, you're asking about specifically, because I think some people will have CSAT, some people might have MPS, which might have different values, but somewhere between 2 and 24 would be my guess. Okay, well it's a bit of an each way bet there, so let's have a look at how the uh, results come there, and indeed you're absolutely spot on. 33% uh, of the audience have between 10 and 24% survey response rate, 
uh, followed by 24% of the audience who've got between 25 and 49%. 21% uh, of between 2 and 9% survey response rate, and uh, at about 10% have actually got over half of the uh, uh, half of the surveys get completed. So well done to uh, well done to that group. I know Dan, you're going to be having a look at uh, uh, some of those uh, surveys in uh, survey response rates and what can be done to improve that. So let's just have a quick look at uh, how people are collecting voice of the customer data. Uh, we've got um, Chloe says we use uh, email surveys and text surveys. Yvonne says we use a net promoter score. Victoria says we use post call and journey level. Uh, Sally says we use feedback surveys and social media. Um, social media. Charlotte says we use call listening. We don't have customer surveys, which is quite an interesting. Where it gives you a, a great deal of depth. Um, uh, we uh, Craig says we use speech analytics, social media, and sentiment analysis which David, I think you might be talking on uh, later. And uh, Abigail says we use CT playback uh, of call recording. So uh, quite a range of different uh, different topics there. So let's uh, jump across now to uh, Dan uh, Maros from Moo. And uh, Dan, if you'd like, like to take us through your thoughts on uh, how is the best way to uh, capture voice of the uh, uh, voice of the customer information. Oh, of course, just give me one minute to bring this up. That's there, just go full screen now. Excellent. Okay. So uh, thanks thanks for the intro. Um, so my name uh, is Dan, as you would have heard, and um, I'm the director of customer experience at Moo.com. Um, we're, we're exclusively online, so all orders placed with Moo are placed online. And about 65% of our orders are placed in the United States or, or Canada, and the rest is, is split between the UK, um, mainland Europe, and, and a little bit further afield. And in my team, I have um, about 50 people in our support team, um, split between the US and the UK. And here you can see some of these lovely people, lots of different hair colors going on there. And um, very, very fortunate that um, in 2016, we were. Um, very lucky, I would say, um, that we won uh, a host of different awards uh, across different uh, award programs um, and categories, some specifically around customer experience. We, we took home customer experience team of the year um, in a couple of those, uh, but also some very specific customer service awards around technology um, and a couple around live chat as well. So enough of the boasting. Um, I have have been a move for ten years, and and over the years, you know, there's lots of different ways that we've been capturing um, customer customer feedback, and it really started off by just um, listening to customers via the um, contact center. So I was the original customer service agent at Moo, um, and when you only have one person listening or answering customer emails, you get a pretty clear picture of what customers are saying because you're looking at it through one single lens. But over the years, you know, we've developed different ways of capturing different types of feedback from customers. And just to kind of give you the, the five different ways that we do this at Moo, the first um, and where we get really great response rates um, are on transactional surveys. So um, from a contact center perspective, we send out um, a customer satisfaction survey shortly after we've dealt with um, a customer query. We get about a 30% response rate um, across live chat, phone, and email. That's quite a simple, good or bad, rate the service, and then leave a comment. And then at the same time, we have more of a, um, a company-wide measure of customer satisfaction or, or, or likelihood to refer, which is the net promoter score. We send that out a couple of days after we expect someone to receive their order. Our response rate on that is, is a little bit lower than it is for CSAT, um, but those two combined give us a really nice way of kind of measuring the satisfaction that someone has with the contact center, but then also how, um, you know, how, how many advocates we have or how likely people are to refer us to other people. Um, on top of capturing the score for Net Promoter, we also give customers the opportunity to tell us why they gave the score. 
So whether it was a low score or a high score, we want to understand what it is that's driving that so that we can pinpoint the problems and, and resolve them or to um, maximize the benefit of the good things that customers like. Next, and, and as I said, as we started with, um, you know, the, the call center, the contact center is one of the best places to capture customer feedback. Every single phone call or live chat or email is, is you know, a customer telling you something that you, you really do have an opportunity to, again, fix or improve. Um, and I'll go into a bit more detail in a minute on different ways that you can capture this within the contact center. Um, ranging from you know very simple methods right through to much more high-tech ways of doing it which I know David will touch on in, in a little while as well the next is really engaging with your employees um, your colleagues you know the they are the ones that listen to customers every day and if you don't have the time or the mechanisms to actually go and analyze the the, the actual contact data then there really is in my opinion no substitute than just engaging with your team whether it's done via focus groups or a voice of employee survey, they're the ones who not only um, handle all of those contacts, but the ones that really feel the emotional burden um, of when customers have a big problem. Um, so they, they can help you understand the frequency of an issue, but not only the frequency, but also just how peed off a customer might be or just how um, bad an experience might be. Mm -hmm. The next is something we don't do a huge amount of at Moo, um, but I know that it, it's a, a much growing um, tool and is used by much larger organizations, um, and that's social listening, so um, things, uh, you know, pieces of, of technology that go off and, and analyze all of the things that customers and non-customers are saying about you on social media. And then the final is um, normally uh, surveys as well, but also can be interviews, and that's, you know, doing much more in-depth customer research one-to-one -one interviews uh, in their um, in the customers environment or focus groups or even just much wider uh, surveys so one of the questions that uh, you know the poll was before was thinking at looking at um, survey response rates and I think there's really five different things that are important um, if you're looking to increase the the rate of completion and obviously the higher your survey response rate the more um, significant the um, the data and the feedback that you're going to get is going to be. If it's only 5% of your customers giving you feedback, it's very hard to justify or, or to glean as much as you would than if it's more than 50. So I'm amazed that people have more than 50, and I'd love to hear some other tips that those those uh, organizations might have. But here are, here are five that I think are, are really important. The first is that timing is key. Um, there's no point in sending someone a survey you know, a month after they've actually finished their transaction. Um, you want to keep it as timely as possible. Um, you know, if it was a phone call, then within, within an hour, I would say, is probably your window. Um, if it's email or, or chat, I think similarly, as soon as you can after that transaction, the better. Um, and I would imagine the longer that you leave it, the lower your response rate will get. The next is um, no one likes a long survey, and, and um, we try to keep surveys at Moo, unless it's a really in-depth piece of research we're doing, we try to keep it as short as possible. So don't overload your customers with really complex, long questions. Keep it simple. Um, and I know that's kind of common sense. And, and on top of that, I think it's really important to be upfront about that. Um, I'm sure we've all received survey emails where it says, it will only take you three minutes, and then 25 minutes later, you're still trying to work out how to get out of the survey and you end up exiting it all together. So be honest up front with how long it's going to take and keep it short. Um, using a relevant channel um, is, going to be, is going to be important. Um, if someone's transacted with you on your website and spoken to you on live chat, then they probably don't want a phone call to ask for feedback. It's more likely that they'll want to engage on the channel that they transacted with. Um, never lead the witness. You know, you don't want very directional questions. You want to keep your, your questions broad so that you're giving customers the opportunity to talk about things that are important to them. The more you um, drive them to analyze a specific thing, the more likely you are to get feedback that, that, that wasn't important to them. So drilling down in your questions to um, you know, ask about the delivery driver um, might not be what that customer wants to talk about, but you're forcing them to give an opinion. So keep it light and high level and allow your customers to drive what it is they want to talk about. 
And then the final one is is around survey fatigue. Um, and really, the golden rule that I have is just don't do to anyone that you wouldn't want done to yourself. Um, you know, make sure you don't send them too many. We've um, I, over the years have seen some examples of where we um, haven't been as joined up in how we send our transactional surveys, and we might have actually sent them a CSAT survey followed by a um, an NPS survey, and then maybe even followed by a um, some sort of marketing promotion. It's not only the survey that you don't want to send too much of, but it's actually making sure that all of your um, comms on that particular channel are not bombarding that customer. So from a contact center perspective, and, and uh, when I say uh, understanding where your customers are calling, I think that this is, is not just calling, this is again live chat and uh, email as well. And there is a plethora of different ways that you can try and understand this. Some that involve you know, sampling small amounts, some that involve trying to cover as many different tickets as possible. Um, and there is a, also a range in complexity. And depending on your budget or the size of your company, you know, the more low-tech and simplistic, probably the better. And it can be just as impactful. Um, I remember when I had a team of three or four customer service agents only, um, we didn't have any ticket tagging. and. The best way I could think to do it was to give them a piece of paper and tell them to just keep a tally. And if there's a certain issue you're trying to track, it's just telling them to, um, you know, not physically but virtually to ring a bell every time that thing occurs. And very quickly you can spot a pattern um, and see which are your biggest your biggest issues. The bigger you get, the more complex your systems might need to get. Um, after a, you know, once our team was getting into the double figures, we realised we had to start tagging tickets. Um, in some way so that we could track issues that were ongoing. And then, um, you know, again, another step up can be getting really detailed in your reasons or your tagging or categorization. And you'll see with really big organizations, sometimes they've got like 100 plus calling codes where they have these little shortcuts that they do every time they get a call so that things can be categorized. And that can be super powerful at understanding the type of contacts you're getting, which channel you're getting them on, um, and you can see you know, when trends are emerging or when um, issues are dissipating, it's really powerful. And finally, and I won't go into too much detail here because I know David's going to talk about it, but there's a lot of new technology at the moment, um, not even just at the moment, over the last few years, um, which is really, uh, rather than having um, humans do this categorization for you um, and, and, you know, only having 100 categories, with text analytics you can have 500 categories and you're getting a computer to do the grunt work for you. Um, and as voice analytics or um, phone analytics gets better, um, you know, I think over time, over the next five, five years, we'll probably see a, um, a much larger increase as the cost of this stuff decreases. I do think, though, and I, I touched on it on the slide before, that really listening to your frontline team is, is massively important. Um, even really sophisticated technology that helps you to capture the reason for contact would benefit from getting feedback from your team, from your colleagues. Um, you know, your frontline staff often hear things before you look at a report. Um, most people looking at reports, especially voice of customer stuff, maybe on a weekly or a monthly basis, whereas your agents will spot trends very, very quickly um, and you want them to feel empowered to alert you about them. Um, there are still some things that, that Technology isn't great at understanding sentiment, for example. Um, not many computers are, are able to understand sarcasm yet. Um, so having humans to uh, supplement any of the technology you're using is, is really important. Um, and, you know, again, stuff might get missed by surveys or tagging, and I think having real humans to do that will, will um, help you to strike a balance between science and art, if you like. Um, so that mix of human and artificial intelligence is really important. Um, and if, if not anything else, and I know this isn't the topic of today's webinar, I think it also really helps you to engage your team. If you start relying on um, technology to inform you of these things, your team will um, feel undervalued or that they don't have a voice, I think it's really important that you try and involve them in um, pinpointing problems and feedback. And to that end, I think, you know, customer experience, we're, we're, we're talking about things in quite a granular sense, but customer experience can't really be captured, or the voice of customer shouldn't really be captured as a single touch point. 
and and in order to map um, the entire experience, you know, from start to finish, you have to use a combination um, of the following things, I think, to capture the entire interaction with your organization. And I think all of the different ways of capturing voice of customer help to do that, you know, all of the the, um, the data and the feedback that we've talked about from the contact center or from employees um, and from surveys is, is vital. And mixing that together, you know, in a cauldron of voice of customer with other customer data from other parts of the business, more commercial um, measures perhaps, can give you a really nice um, hot pot of, of information and it means that you kind of start off with a sketch maybe that starts off with something that came via a survey then you engage with your colleagues to kind of color it in a bit more and if you add all of this stuff together you can get to a, a really vivid picture whereas if you're looking at only one thing it's it's a little bit more vague um, and a bit more sketchy um, and you know what we've started doing a lot of them is actually um, using a combination of all of those things um, with something called customer experience journey mapping to really get to the root of the problem. Um, and we've been doing this, we've been doing about four a month um, and it, it means we're taking agents away from the front line and identifying a particular experience that customers typically go on. Um, we map it out um, and then we, we try to pinpoint the moment in that experience where where there's an opportunity or the moment that really matters in that experience. Um, understand all of the on-stage and the backstage people, process and technology that's involved, and then try to devise new solutions or, or wow moments. And sometimes that will be an opportunity for a, a large-scale kind of organizational change um, where it might be outside of the control of, of, of the customer experience or the contact center team. But what we're trying to do is to find, you know, small marginal gains that we can make in the contact center. So designing little solutions that we can implement quickly to make little wins, and then also identifying the kind of utopian uh, silver bullet, if you like, and trying to campaign and lobby for those to get put on our company roadmap further down the line. So this is just some photos of us doing journey mapping. So we try to have four or five people in each session. We've also found that it's really useful to invite people from other teams in the business to come along. So its main core is customer service people. But for example, we did a refer a friend journey map recently. We pulled in the um, uh, someone from our CRM team who owns the refer a friend program. And it's got this great mix of um, simplifying um, complex problems and understanding where the real crux of an issue is. But also, again, engaging your frontline staff on seeing the bigger picture, understanding all of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes with all of these things. Um, and now that we've started pulling in people from the rest of the organization, I think you get to see a really broad view of how something works. This is a, an example of kind of what you end up with if you do a journey map. This was one where I, unfortunately, I don't know if you can see it along the top, I used Patrick Bateman as our customer. Um, there's a very <laughs> fam famous scene in uh, American Psycho with his business cards so we used. We used a fictional customer in that instance. Um, and from these sessions, you know, I mentioned having kind of larger scale development plans or company-wide initiatives. Our real chief goal um, in doing, in taking all of the data and information we have and then doing these journey mapping sessions is to try and drive um, smaller marginal gains in the contact center because we know it's stuff that we control, that we can make a difference with. And some examples of recent things we've, we've done, and the majority of the work coming out of, out of these sessions for us to tackle ourselves, actually, tend to be around proactive notifications and reach out. So if there's any way that we can circumvent a customer having to get in touch with us um, and actually reach out to them before it happens, there's been a couple of um, instances where we've come out and added some new proactive stuff into our um, into our day-to-day -day operation, but also um, looking at ways of improving our self-service content or, or can solutions. You know, is there a better way we can help customers to self-serve, or make, can we make a video that better explains something, or even just making it easier for our um, agents to deal with those issues when they arise. And then even simple things like, you know, is there a bit of missing training here? Is there a bit of knowledge missing for these agents so that when this problem does occur, we're not dealing with it in the best way? Um, or is our policy wrong? 
Um, so we've been doing a lot, a lot of different things along those lines. Small things, we're not going to win. You know, we're not going to save millions of pounds with this sort of stuff. But our goal is cumulatively, we're going to be mending small parts of the customer experience, kind of plugging the leaky bucket, if you like, in that experience. Um, and that is me done, um, and I'll go back to John T in the studio. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dan. I think some uh, great uh, insight there, uh, and uh, certainly I think the um, uh, you know there's a range of, of points there. I think uh, I think you're absolutely right. It is a blend of science and art. Um, certainly, you know the, the hot pot of information you you, you talked about. Uh, getting to the root of the problem, I think, is very key, and also. Uh, pinpointing the moments in the customer journey. So before we get into top tips and questions, I'd like to ask a poll of the uh, audience, and that if it's someone leaves a negative comment on a survey, what proportion of customers do you uh, call back and talk to talk to about that? So is it between 0 and 1%? Is it 2 to 9%? Is it 10 to 24%? 25 to 49% or is it 50% plus? So David, I don't know if you've got any uh, prediction of where you think the answer's likely to come here. Don't know if David's on mute. Very right, chancy. Um, I, I would hope it would be as high as possible. Um, I'm going to go for 25 to 49%. Okay, well let's have a look at the, uh, look, have a look at the results and you uh, hoped it would be as high as possible. In fact, uh, for two-thirds of the audience, uh, if uh, someone does leave a negative comment, do actually call people back. I think that's a very encouraging, uh, very encouraging uh, statistic. Uh, Dan, does that tie in with, with what you've been doing? Yeah, I mean, we actually we aim for 100%. It's quite encouraging to see um, that others uh, are in a similar bracket. But I must, if I was being honest, um, it took us a long time to, to get there. In the old days, I think it was probably closer to 5 or 10%. Um, but yeah, 100% is our goal now. Excellent. Well, I think that should be the goal of, uh, of all organizations, uh, really, because if uh, you uh, ask a question, you probably need to, uh, need to act on it. So let's have a look at some of the tips coming through. Amanda says, offer an incentive to complete the survey. Keep them short and send them out straight after the call is resolved via email. We offer our customers an incentive, and that is usually 10% off their next order. Dan, do you offer incentives? Um, own, it depends what the complaint is, um, but most most negative comments end up with us either reprinting something or giving them a promo code, maybe even giving them a full refund and, uh, and just unfortunately losing customers. But yeah, win back is important. So Sarah says, uh, uh, don't ask questions you already know the answers to. Who the delivery driver was, what was the serial number, contact details. You should really have that as information for the for the survey. David, that's probably just a bit of laziness in some of the some of the coding of, of the technology. I'm guessing there. Um, yeah, I think that's an excellent. Um, Sarah makes an excellent point there. Um, it, it's hard enough to get people to play ball and respond as it is without wasting time and, um, and wasting that resource asking for menial details like that. Yep, so it's about uh, joining up uh, some of the, the pieces there. Uh, Charlie says, we have a process to remove duplicates within three months, so even regular customers will only receive a survey once every three months at the most. Certainly I do find on, uh, I've got a uh, a few IT companies I, I uh, uh, need support from, and I do get a survey after every call. Uh, and if you've got four calls on an issue, that can be a little bit um, over the over the top. Um, let's have a look. Sunita says we measure customer satisfaction after each moment of truth. Uh, I know moments of truth were something you were talking about, Dan. So if the uh, so we let the customer know to expect a short survey, and their feedback is valuable. It would only take a second to rate the service they've received, and that seems to help with our response rates. Dan? Yeah, I mean, I think there is um, a benefit of doing that, but I'm not sure that necessarily asking all of your customers after every moment of truth is maybe going to annoy them, but 
it depends on how long that journey is and how far apart those moments might be. And maybe yes, by us, you know, if you sample people, um, have different samples of people, you could ask them at different places and they wouldn't get so angry, maybe. Okay, well, here's a, a, an interesting question, and um, I guess Craig is responding to the, to the question that Amanda said about offering incentive. And does the offer, offering incentive correlate with survey accuracy? I guess there's always a, uh, a danger there, and I don't, don't know if there's any, any answer to this. David, do you think this, that there's a, uh, that, you know, sort of, uh, you might get slightly skewed results if a survey, if an incentive was offered? Um, well, I mean, clearly, if, uh, Sarah was um, it was working. You know, if it works for them, then that's great. I think you're quite right. There is always a risk that we will then start to respond for the incentive rather than to respond to give you know, an accurate point of view. I okay. just realised that I I just realised that I misunderstood the original question before. We don't give any incentives for taking transactional surveys, but when it is a lengthy survey. Um, sometimes we use a prize draw rather than a blanket thing for everybody. It's you get a chance to win something. No, that's quite a good idea. Uh, Victoria says we don't offer an incentive. If people want to leave feedback, they will. Uh, she thinks the trick is to get it out as soon as possible. Uh, Darren has said when using a post call survey, only give customers the ability to provide a verbatim comment. If you have the responses to listen to or log, perhaps using an accurate speech to text system and act upon them and follow up with the customer if needed. Uh, David, I think this is quite a nice nice approach. Yeah, I, th I think that's uh, an excellent thing to do. If you do have the facilities to take free text, free speech, um, and pop that into you know, the overall mix of the analysis you're doing, then that, that's a great thing to do. And I guess that also helps if you're looking for problems later of a particular area, you can search through that to uh, to sort of drill down on on where you you might find that that's uh, affecting. Yeah, certainly very um, very useful in terms of um, trend analysis and getting to the root root cause of, of problems. And again, um, you know, as Victoria is saying here, you know, the trick is to re then to respond to that and fix it as quickly as possible. Right, well, let's have a look at a few more tips before we uh, uh, jump into the next presentation. Uh, it's not just the surveys or call listening, but has to do everything with the time frame uh, in which you coach the employee to correct behavior. So I guess that's if uh, you get feedback and you can send that back to the employee, they can then think, oh, perhaps I did do that. Differently. Your yep. screen's currently on pause, so we can't see ah. what you're looking at. Uh, there we are. Hopefully uh, that should be uh, showing up now. Everything to do with the, the time frame. Uh, Charlie said, uh, make the customer survey stats and customer comments matter. Ours are linked down, from the down the line from the company targets to my targets and to my team's targets. That way we're all working together for the same cause targets and everyone cares about the customer's, customer's voice. I think that's quite an interesting one, Dan. I, sometimes you, you sense that there's a sort of lack of alignment between top level objectives and and surveys. Yeah, I mean, I think the key here is that, that, that there is something that can link it to company targets. I mean, for some companies, it's not even a target. So, um, but where you do, I think, yeah, they call this the golden thread, don't they, where stuff is all linked right through from the top of the organization down to the people on the front line. And I think um, having this stuff linked to incentive or, um, career development or, or, or performance management, I think all of those things being tied together is of massive benefit to the organization. Right, so here's the last uh, uh, tip or opinion for the, for the time being. An interesting one, Victoria said, we had an old survey where staff had to manually transfer calls, uh, presumably that was a, to, to the survey line, and the results were great because they were only transferring the good calls. We changed that now and everyone has the option to uh, opt out within the within the IVR. Um, I guess this is, uh, David, a real case of, uh, of survey bias coming in here. Yeah, <laughs> and that's something we've seen, um, we've seen many times for sure. Um, I think the, the, real, um, the real value is having the truth, good or bad. Well, I think that's probably a good time now to uh, talk about a different approach to um, 
uh, voice of the customer of how you eliminate some of the uh, some of the survey uh, survey bias there. So um, um, so David, if we'd like to uh, transfer across to to you, and if you'd like to take us through your thoughts about how technology may be able to help in this. Okay, so um, good afternoon everyone, thank you very much. Um, my name is David Mason. I'm a major accounts manager here at Business Systems UK Limited. Um, BSL is currently the UK's um, leading and most established provider of call recording and workforce optimization solutions. Um, we were founded in 1988, so we have nearly 30 years experience of helping our customers select best of breed product um, and services to better support their customer facing operations. Over the next few moments, what I'd like to do is just share a couple of additional ideas and tag on to the presentation that Dan has given to talk about other technologies that might assist in specifically um, targeting and, and getting feedback from customers who choose not to actively voice their opinion. Um, and remain um, and remain silent. So, if we look at the first um, the first method of communication, um, and the one that we talked about probably most um, so far, and that's just a simple telephone call. And listening to a customer when they when they're on the end of a live telephone line should be easy, right? Well, it kind of would be if it were the only thing that you had to do. But most companies drive their contact center agents, their service support people as example, um, to do lots of other things whilst they're actually on the engagement itself. So they've got to be cheerful and helpful, very knowledgeable, they've got to access company and uh, customer information. And by the way, you need to also adhere to compliance regulations and you've got 420 seconds to do all of that. And that's before we even get the opportunity to make a cross-sell or an upsell um, attempt. So in other words, it's really complex and there's lots of things to do. And it's a sad reality that um, humans just kind of tend to revert to type and they tend to focus more on what's important to them rather than maybe what might be more important to the caller itself. Um, what that means is that you get a kind of slightly skewed perspective. Now to counter that, and some of the uh, some of the callers today have already alluded that they use things like quality monitoring, quality evaluation, um, to keep tabs on how we're doing against corporate um, objectives that we have ourselves, so operational and knowledge-based objectives, but also how well or, or not that we are delighting the customer. The problem is that QM can also often be done with a kind of company corporate bias rather than standing in the shoes of the customer. So what we're going to do is, just, I'll give you a little example of, uh, a visual example of how a um, call evaluation might work. So it's a small window of opportunity to look at the content of a call and establish how well we've done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show everyone on this call a picture, and in that period of time, it's going to flash up for five seconds, um, I want you to have in your mind's eye how many things you actually see. And that's it. That's your evaluation over. You've had a period of time to review it. And I think if John T was to um, do a, a mass poll now, I'm pretty confident that most people would say they saw one thing and that was a lion. Um, and that's good, because there definitely was a line in there, but there was also something else. And there's something else if you view that picture from another perspective. So let's have a little look at it again. We're now going to look at it from the other side, which is the customer perspective. I wonder how many people see something else. And you know what? If I, look at the if I ask a thousand people this question, some of them can see it, maybe half can see it, maybe half can't. So we'll make it a little simpler still. Now the lion's disappeared and we're seeing something rather different, not really the king of the jungle that we may have thought we were looking at at the beginning. And the point that I make there is that um, quality evaluation does definitely have a, play, a place and it drives good behaviours from a, a corporate perspective. But it's really hard sometimes to marry that into what customers 
a feeling, a narrow goal experience, specifically if they don't actually say on the call, I'm happy, I'm not happy, I don't care, I'm leaving, I'm staying, I want to buy more, whatever it is. So let's have a look at how we might progress from that to employ services of other technologies to up our game. So I think the first stepping stone is to make sure that we have a digital record of every interaction that we have with the customer. If they explicitly phone our contact center, then that's great. Most people now have um, call recording facilities. Um, but there are also other recording facilities for maybe field-based operatives, delivery drivers, assessors, loss adjusters, reps that are on the, on the road and maybe contacting um, customers directly. Also, um, that also incorporates um, digital interactions, things like web activity, uh, people coming onto a website, social media, email, and everything else in between. Um, the other area, of course, is those businesses that have uh, an opportunity for customers to come into store so or into a branch. So being able to have some kind of record, if, if they're coming into a bank branch to transact on a, a mortgage, for example, um, where you know, you're in a competitive situation, it may be good to report that overall experience and put that into the mix also. Once we've done that, and of course, as everyone on the call is saying, it's good in a timely way to send out customer feedback. But as we've seen already, I mean, I guess I haven't crunched the numbers, but I'm guessing we're looking at late teens, let's call it 15% maybe, of people that actually respond, which means there are a massive 85% of people who actually don't. So how can we touch those? Well, we've already said that quality monitoring is a good proactive way of um, analyzing interactions that we've had with a customer and reviewing them to make sure we're doing the things that we um, should be doing. But we've also established, hopefully, that they can be a little bit biased from our point of view. The other thing about quality monitoring is that it's sheer volume. So if, um, for example, Sally in our contact center takes 500 calls over a period of time, and each one of those to review correctly would take three to four um, times real time, it takes them a week to handle those calls. You're talking about three or four weeks to make sure we've analyzed every single call. So the default position would be to take a small subset. So let's say, for example, out of that 500, we choose to look at eight. If it were me, and I had a way of doing it, I would like to say, show me the four best calls that Sally had with our customers, because they tell us something about what we do might be unique, and we want to spread that across the enterprise. But also show me the four worst calls. Show me the calls where customers say, you know what, I'm not satisfied, I'm leaving. So let's just take a look at that for a moment. As we said, the calls are generally random, and that's kind of what random looked like. There's no insight at all. So here's our eight customer faces looking back at us. And if we overlay those over the 500, in fact, there's 504 there, um, customer interactions that we had, we can see that in this particular case, we were lucky and picked at random one dissatisfied customers. However, there were also three others that we failed to review. And we didn't look at any at all who actually absolutely love us. So it's a little bit like buying a lottery ticket. Sometimes you might win a £10 note. Oftentimes you win nothing at all, and you very rarely hit the jackpot. I think the chances of hitting the jackpot on the lottery was something like about 14 million to one. The chances of picking eight, those eight balls out of that 504 is a very much larger number. In fact, it's so large I don't even know how to express it, so I just tend to call it <laughs> almost, almost impossible. Um, to, to hit the most valuable nuggets to drive your customer satisfaction forward. So where do we go from quality monitoring? As a couple of people have said on the call already, we move on to interaction analytics, which is a, a great piece of technology, not exactly new. I mean, I've been representing it here at Business Systems for about 10 years, but still sadly not employed. And maybe Dan gave a little bit of an inkling 
um, into why, because one of the first um, comments that customers make is, well, that must be quite expensive. And it can be, depending on what you choose. But the whole idea of analytics is it's not really about the cost. It's, it's about what it can do to drive your customer experience forward, how, how you can use it to be a foundation product to grow your business. So what's the difference between analytics and quality monitoring? The difference is that we're now looking at 100% um, interactions. So think about the 500 that take a week for Sally to take, those calls three or four weeks to review them properly, we can now do that literally in minutes. Not only voice recordings, but also um, email, web chat, social media. Every interaction that we have can use exactly the same methodology to be analyzed. And the first thing we need to do is take all of those interactions and put them into um, categories of calls or interactions. Specific buckets of interaction types so it could be as easy as show me all calls that had a high level of emotion that were angry and mentioned dissatisfaction. It could, show, it could be show me all calls where a product or service was upgraded. It could be more complex. So if I'm selling mobile telephones, it could be show me all existing customers that phoned in for the latest iPhone 7 did not ask us to post them a new handset, and during the call had a raised level of emotion and asked to see or be sent their terms and conditions of contract and mentioned a competitive offer. Because what that says is we've got an existing customer who seemed to be quite happy because they asked us for a new handset. Something happened on the call and now they're thinking about leaving us and actually have rejected the offer of a new handset, which has cost us money. So once we have those um, types of calls, we can use lots of uh, other facilities within the solution to further validate the calls, to refine the queries, and actually then start to eke out things that we didn't know. So show me things that I didn't know. Um, topics that perhaps our customers are talking about and mentioning to us, but we didn't actually write a query for. We can make a note of those and go and investigate that in greater detail. Once we have all that, we can then start to trend and get to the root cause of whatever problems we might have, capitalize on the things that we're doing good, so that we can deliver real insight back into the business. We can make some adaptive refinement to our customer-facing um, people if we need to, via additional training, perhaps. Um, and then we feed the whole process around again. We monitor the interactions after that remedial um, action. Or we take that insight and act immediately to do something else with our customers. So what might that be? In its extreme cases, um, interaction analytics can be used real time. So that might be if a call is going off the rails and the agent is starting to lose control, maybe that could be flagged to, um, to instigate some proactive um, intervention from a manager, from a supervisor, from a product specialist. Or it could be used to drive some real-time systems, maybe some kind of robotics tools um, to screen pop. So if a customer says um, maybe they're, a, they're phoning to an insurance company to renew a motor policy and just happens to mention to the agent that um, they're moving closer to the coast to be nearer their boat, um, it might be a good opportunity to have flagged up that we also do boat insurance and we don't seem to be covering you at the moment. So if you like a real-time sat-nav for agents, tweak the best out of every single call. Um, correspondingly, if they mention a, a, a competitive product or service, maybe that would screen pop a knowledge base to instantly give the agent the information right in front of them that allows them to counter that offer. The thing about feedback, QM, analytics, real-time assistance is that it all produces a whole wealth of reports and MI. And in my considerable experience of some 30 odd years now in this business, most of my customers are dying under the weight of reports and, and MI. So we would advocate a 
comprehensive, maybe business intelligence portal, something that can take the best of all the various methods of reporting from each solution and bring it into one unified view um, for the business, which can then be stored historically and allow the customer to track its performance against targets, how they're coping with customers and so on and so forth. So an awful lot there and Honestly, each one of those could probably do with two or three webinars in their own right. I know that you know, John T performs them on a, on a regular basis, but that's just to give a taste of how we see the kind of evolution and how we see customers employing the later technologies to take, take some of the grunt work, as Dan put it, out of actually managing you know, as many customers as you can effectively. And the collective term for that is workforce um, optimization. And in my mind, I see the first point of failure being um, actually not being able to speak to somebody. So I phone my mobile provider, my utilities, my water provider, gas board, whoever it is, and either not being able to get through to speak to anyone at all, or when I do speak to somebody, they don't really know what I'm talking about, and I get passed from pillar to post. So effective workforce management tools to make sure you've got the right bums on the right seats at the right time. Time with the right skills is all important. As you said, reporting applications, making sure you keep a digital record of everything you do so that you can employ the, um, the technologies of evaluation, analytics, stepping that up to robotic um, automation in some cases, automating the process, taking some of the grunt work out, and customer feedback. And you can bring those all together. Um, is all important, specifically with a business intelligence tool. Um, interesting and something that uh, I don't think I, I mentioned, we talked about kind of free text and free speech on, um, on uh, customer feedback. Um, the same tools, the same process um, analytics can be used for that live kind of data as it comes in exactly the same way as it can be from um, historical recordings. The other thing I'd just like to finish on is that um, I think it's a really good tip not to be afraid to engage expert support services from whichever supplier you deal with. Um, these, these tools um, take time to learn. You know, it, it's a bit like probably the, the best advice if you want to learn to drive is not to just jump into the driving seat and set off. <laughs> I would definitely have an experienced driver, experienced instructor showing us what to do because if you do do it on your own, you're probably likely to go off the rails. And that's exactly the same with these tools. They're complex, they're sophisticated, and they take the time to get, to, to get used to. Um, most organizations will provide some brilliant services to really make sure you hit the, the floor running. And you know, in today's business world where budgets are becoming ever, ever smaller, and expectations are becoming ever higher, it really is false economy to try and bite the bullet and do it yourself. So hopefully that gives a kind of overview of how that kind of um, cycle might work. Um, that kind of concludes my little bit. I think I'm probably out of time. Um, happy to hand back to um, John T, please. Well, thanks very much for that, David. I think you must have been uh, a, a silent witness in my first uh, car uh, uh, experience, which was just jumping in a car, letting the clutch out, and driving straight into a brick wall. Uh, that was the age of 17 in my first driving experience. So I think, yes, don't just straight <laughs> jump straight into the tools uh, without any assistance. And I'd certainly also echo your, uh, uh, your comments there about um, being buried under the uh, weight of reports. I see a huge amount of uh, report generation in uh, uh, in contact centers. So thank you very much for that. We're now going to uh, jump back into the um, jump back into the, the, the chat room and um, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's see if I can show my screen here. Is that coming up Rachel? It is, yes. Okay, excellent. So let's have a look at some top tips and questions from the audience. Uh, Sunita says, surveys are usually competed by those who are fans of yours or really annoyed, which is why we look at contact reason, how many contacts are received in a given time frame. An aggravation index is a good metric to include voice of the customer 
reporting. David, I, I think you'd probably advertise uh, analytics as a way of looking at those silent, uh, uh, silent people who are neither fans nor or enemies. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it allows you to drill down whether or not the customer wants to take part or not. I think. I think the thing is, it's human nature not necessarily to voice our opinion. I, I read something recently that only 4% of people actually choose to complain. And I think if we're honest, all of us have sat in a restaurant having dinner, um, grumbling about it not being actually to our liking. The waiter comes over and says, how is it for you? And we say, oh, everything's fine, thank you. That's not really helpful in, to them or to yourself. So. I think that's a very British, uh, it's a very British way, I think. Yeah, I don't think you get that in the States so much, but uh, Chloe says, leave it to the customer. Just to ask one simple question with a free text box. Analyzing the positive negative sentiment of the comments allows us to drill into the root cause. I, there's something about this one of actually, I, I quite like the simplicity. And I, I guess that if you're only asking two questions, you probably get quite a high, quite a high take up rate for. Kimberly says, in our team, we have a voice of the customer expert who manages everything about it by making sure the tone of voice is rolled out across all the channels and reports this on a daily basis. As well as contacting every customer who's a detractor, we also reply to all promoters to say thank you. As well as the regular call monitoring, everyone in the team reviews five of their own calls, emails and web chat responses a month to continue to learn and see how they can improve personally. Dan? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I mean, the, the first bit about having a voice of customer expert sounds like a, a brilliant luxury. I mean, we only in the last couple of years have actually uh, dedicated customer experience uh, people rather than just uh, contact center staff. But um, love the idea of reaching out to all the promoters as well. Probably a bit costly, um, but sounds like it might be worthwhile. And um, I think kind of this quest for personal improvement is one that I wish we could instill in everybody. Um, mm. Definitely. Well, here's an interesting one from Craig. Are all people equal when it comes to the voice of the customer? For instance, do you have higher spenders or longer service serving members categorized so you know whose voice is essentially louder? That's quite an interesting one because often, you know, with particularly loyal customer, you may not pick up on, on subtle clues that are, of how, how they're affecting them. I know some of the mobile phone companies would have very, very valuable customers who didn't want to upgrade their handset every every three years, but when the, hand, you know, when the factory of the battery life got, the phone didn't work anymore, would just switch switch providers, because that was, you know, they could find one in, in, in a shop and off they went. I think there's just, 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 I think the idea of like uh, whose voice is louder is really important. Um, you can't please all customers all of the time. You know, like some things in your company's roadmap are the way they are, and sometimes it's kind of tough luck. You know, no matter how loud someone shouts, and that that loud voice could be someone who's worth a lot of money. But if it's outside of what the company thinks is the right thing to do, sometimes it's, it's, um, sadly, it's not always possible to to rectify. Okay, let's have a couple of more tips. Uh, in quality monitoring, we ensure that the agents on the call are included in rating at least one call for reflection. Uh, the team mark this themselves along with the team leader and myself as quality coordinator. This helps them to realize how the candidate may feel calling us and discuss how the situation may be seen from a different, different point of view. David, you talked about selecting different different calls. I think this idea of one for reflection is interesting. No, I think that's an excellent um, discipline to have. Um, you know, it's something that we've um, promoted for a long time. And in our experience, actually, agents tend to mark themselves more harshly than their supervisor or, or team leader. So it's a, it's a really, um, really good thing to do. I guess, for me, um, the icing on the cake would be able to, um, being able to uh, pick specific call types, though, you know, calls that had certain attributes. Because you know, reviewing a call which is about a change of address is has its limitations. Let's just say. Okay. Well, let's have a, a look at another uh, audience opinion here. Ultimately, humans are lazy. Unless there is something in it for me, uh, or they're incredibly pleased or incredibly annoyed. Survey responses will either give vanilla results or have a low uptake. 
automation, machine leading, speech analytics, social sentiment analysis ultimately takes out the perceived effort and most importantly puts all feedback on an even set of rules, so open less to interpretation. It's relatively early days on this kind of technology, but the last 18 months has certainly seen it improve a lot. The, the, there's just one thing. I think that's a brilliant, a brilliant point um, and very well put. The only thing that I would caveat it with is you can only listen or apply automation and machine learning to people that have contacted you. Um, you're always going to get a bias of some nature. Um, you know, the, to the point of only 4% of people complain. Even if you're listening to um, to those people that are getting in touch, that's still not going to be everybody. They're either going to be the incredibly annoyed who took the time to let you know that they were annoyed. So I think the same is true of, uh, of those new technologies. Yeah, I think that there's always a, a danger of that, of the silent silent people. And I guess that's why we, we take the voice of the customer so seriously, is that if an issue affects someone and they complain about it, there's probably someone who hasn't complained about it, and if you can, uh, uh, you know, do root cause fixing of the problem, that can uh, certainly help that. Well, we've hit the top of the hour. Um, in one or two words, if you could leave uh, our own voice of the customer feedback, if you could uh, type into either the post call survey or if you could type it into the chat room now. Uh, the winning tip: we've got this uh, either box of chocolates or this nice um, uh, bottle of champagne, and today's winner uh, I've selected is Chloe, who, uh, uh, whose advice was effectively keep it simple and uh, don't ask too many questions, which I think ties in very nicely. Uh, there's a replay available probably from about one hour's time, uh, callcenterhelper.com forward slash uh, recorded webinars. And uh, we're taking a break and we will be back in two weeks time for our online conference where we have uh, four webinars across two days. I'd just like to uh, thank our two speakers, uh, Dan Ross from Moo, thank you very much for joining us and sharing your insight. Pleasure, thanks for having me. And David Mason from Business Systems, thank you for uh, joining us and sharing your thoughts on, uh, uh, on technology. Certainly uh, I'll be uh, trying to work out those odds of uh, selecting eight out of uh, 500 and for, I've forgotten how you do that, and I need to uh, refresh myself. So thank you, David. Really like that. Thanks very much. Cheers. Excellent. And uh, thank you, everybody, and we'll see you again in two weeks' time. Bye-bye. <laughs>